Join us, friends. Great Scott, Spa Guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, Spa Guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. <laughs> we were trying to leave. Did you see us? <laughs> It was a great show, Spy Guy. This is the Spy Guy, and this is Hello, Trotting with Trey. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey or trying to leave, but we know that there's a lot of people that are wishing Cotton was a monkey out there. And to give you an idea about what Wigwam is, Wigwam is a reference to this fake world that we live in, where people say things that they don't really mean, and they say things that are not true as if they are true. And that is Wigwam in the nutshell. Yeah. So, Trey, how are you been doing? Billy, I've, as you know, I've been all over the place, man. I'm back now, uh, but I've been to Miami, been, been up to Nashville, been to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, New Orleans. So I'm jealous, man. You've been traveling like a, uh, like a globetrotter, actually. Globetrotter. That's why I'm globetrotting with Trey. That's exactly right. I hadn't been traveling that much lately. I did a little bit, but not nothing like you've been able to do. Yeah. Well, you'll be able to get on the road pretty soon, though, and uh, yeah. do really some cool things. Well, I had a big trip planned, and uh, and I think some recent events might might stop that, but we'll yeah. talk about that later, yeah. at least postpone it for a period of time. Yeah. Anyway, so I know that you, um, you had a special trip down to – can we start with Miami? South Beach. Let's talk about South Beach. All right. So you went all the way down to South Beach to Miami, and you went there for a specific reason. Now, we know that you filmed some other stuff while you were there, of course, some iconic things. You, In fact, you just recently put a video out that you filmed down there. Fountain Blue. But Fountain Blue, where Elvis was with Frank Sinatra in one of what I think is one of the most iconic Elvis moments where he's finally out of the military, uh, 1960. And he goes actually through uh, Nashville. You remember Union Station Hotel, which was the train station. He actually leaves from there and goes to Miami. And you have and on that. You have filmed that place in Nashville. I have filmed that place and actually got uh, had a little incident there while I was there. We haven't dealt with that yet, but uh, we'll we'll talk about that one day. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, he left from there, went to Miami. And when you see Frank Sinatra and Elvis when they're doing witchcraft in Love Me Tender, the 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 mix, I I have pulled that up many times and shown people and said, that right there is what a superstar looks like. And I'm talking about Elvis. Yeah. He yep. just was, he had to be on top of the world there. He had to be, man. And I've stood now in that room, Spy Guy. And uh, you just mentioned that uh, my last episode last week on Globe Trotting with Trey was at the Fountain Blue. So I go inside the room. I got lucky that day. They had an event in there. So they had a stage set up. And uh, I just, you know, walked in and uh, just filmed, did my thing. <laughs> Nobody asked me any questions or anything. And I walked down to the stage because I figured, you know, just by the layout that uh, uh, that stage would have probably been set up in that section of, of the room with the ceiling and everything. And I learned some fascinating things. Like before the show, something fell from the ceiling. Didn't hurt anyone, but it landed like on the stage or something. So that hmm. was something that happened that no one knows about. Also the Colonel, and this is why the Colonel to me is brilliant and was a great uh, uh, plus for Elvis was the the Colonel gave away 350 tickets to his fans outside the fountain blue. Cause he wanted Elvis Presley's fans to be inside that room, the sparkle room today. It was, I believe the East grand ballroom back when it was, uh, the Sinatra show was filmed in there. Uh, he wanted those fans screaming girls out there, uh, that's in the drive in the, uh, parking area to be inside that room that night, 350. And that's why it's so great. The noise wise when Elvis is on stage, because it's really, truly his fans. And probably some of you maybe that was watching, hopefully, uh, were able to experience that night in Miami, Florida, 1960. That's incredible. So what, what are the details of it? Because when you look at the, at the clip and of course there's a lot of different stuff, it's Elvis interacting with all these different people. The Rat Pack was there, right? 
uh, 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 Sammy Davis. Um, Joey yeah. Bishop was there. Joey Bishop was there. Okay. And, and uh, Dean. Dino. Dean Dino. Martin, yeah. yeah. So the Rat Pack was there. So when you look at the clips, it looks like a major Dean TV Martin. set. Yeah, but Dean, Dean was not there. Was not there, but it was uh, Sammy Davis and the other Joey Jeff, Bishop. Bishop and Sinatra, and then uh, Nancy. Nancy. Nancy Sinatra uh, came on stage and did some things with Elvis. Yeah. You know, they had a little jokes, a little skit type deal. And, uh, uh, but man, yeah, Welcome Home Elvis by Timex. Timex was the sponsor of this show. And, um, you know, I, I, it looks like he did like three or four of the Sinatra shows there at the Fountain Blue. See, the Fountain Blue was the place that Sinatra loved in Miami Beach. So he ha- he filmed three of his movies with the Fountain Blue in the movie. Hmm. Uh, Tony Romo, they're out on the beach, and there's a really cool shot uh, shot of the Fountain Blue behind uh, Sinatra out on the beach. And another thing that I, I, I learned when I was out there, the beach was uh, the water came higher up back then than it does today. So when I was standing out there at the uh, at the line at the where the waves rolled in, man, that was way out there back then in the sixties. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I don't know if it was because a certain year the photo was taken or whatever, but man, it seems like the beach has changed a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's what 50, 60 years. Well, they've built up a lot of things, I would think. You know, there's a lot of building there, yeah. a lot of new things. They don't uh, walk. It's really cool if you ever go to Miami, you can like uh take your bike like you would like to do, spy guy, and you would be able to ride your bike down that entire boardwalk and go anywhere. Mm-hmm. To. Back then in Sinatra, uh, in the uh, Elvis Sinatra days, uh, that whole swimming pool area that I captured and I, I show it in the film uh, was a, a different. They, it was one big swimming pool back then with a high diving board. Now there's like four or five different swimming pools out there. And the boardwalk where there's a famous iconic shot of Frank Sinatra on the boardwalk, um, that's all gone now. Uh, but I was able to figure out where that curve was in that shot with Sinatra and the new boardwalk is kind of running in that area now. And I think they have like a little bar area out there, out there where that would have been back then. So man, but the fountain blue man is iconic because the lobby's still the same. They have those staircase to nowhere, famous staircase to nowhere that uh, the bellhop allowed me to walk up and, uh, and film. I told him I had to do that, but man, yeah, it was just standing in that room, man. I was like, wow, Elvis. Frank Sinatra had a show right here. Yeah. Iconic <laughs> show, Iconic which was kind of the return of Elvis. Yeah. Welcome home. Yeah. Time X. Also, I also and, filmed some other stuff uh, to go along with that, like uh, the train stop. There's a really cool story with Elvis uh, coming in, into town uh, for this show. And also I uh, learned some cool things that Elvis did and places he visited when he was in town filming the Sinatra show that I was able to locate spy guy. And those are going to be some future episodes, right? I sent you a picture. Yeah. Really cool place, right? Yeah. But those are going to be future episodes. They're not out yet. They're not out yet. They're future episodes. And uh, Miami's big money too, by the way. So you saw a lot of uh, Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces and Bentleys and yeah, all the all the exotic cars, man. Let turn. I turned to my right and to my left, and there was something really cool uh, driving past me. Um, but uh, also history wise, Miami is very important to Desi Arnaz, and I was able to film a lot of Desi Arnaz places that people don't know about. I'm sure, and uh, um, that's I'm, where he got his beginning when he came from Cuba. Yeah, and guess, uh, spa guy, guess who his friend was that went to school with him in Miami? Hmm. Al Capone's son. Oh, that's right. Al Capone's son. That's right. And I went Al to Capone Al- knew Desi Arnaz. And guys, I went to Al Capone's house and filmed. And I'm not going to tell you anymore. Billy knows what happened, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but Al wasn't there. I know that. I didn't get to see Al. Uh, yeah. uh, I'll tell you, let me tell you a good Desi Arnaz story with that. So, like I said, Desi Arnaz was good friends, was Al's son. They graduated together from a high school in Miami, which I captured, I filmed. And uh, so Desi said that one day he called his friend, friend's house and a man answered the phone. 
and he didn't recognize the the other man's uh, voice on the other line. And Desi Arnaz was like, "Who's this?" And you can can't you hear him? <laughs> how he would say that, you know? And uh, the man was said, um, uh, "This is Al. I'm so and so's father." And then Desi was just like, "Oh crap! I'm talking to Al Capone." And mm-hmm. he, was, Desi, aren't you? Yeah, I've heard a lot about you, Desi. So he, and Desi Arnaz had a phone conversation with Al Capone. <laughs> Once upon a time, man. I mean, that's that so crazy. So, but that took place at that house where I, I uh, filmed at. So I wonder if uh, Al Capone was alive. I don't know his history enough. Was he alive when Desi Arnaz's show would have been going? No, no. Capone died, I believe, in like 19, uh, early 50. Or maybe oh, okay, so the Lucy that. show was at the in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, right? Oh, Lucy's show was early 50. He died in the 50s. Yeah, uh, Capone died January the 25th, 1947. So, oh, yeah. okay. So he never knew he was famous. De- uh, Desi became uh, Lucy and Desi started I Love Lucy, I believe, like in 1951, 52. Really? That early? I figured it was late 50s. That's interesting. Yeah, I think like 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57. You have to think when Elvis is becoming Elvis, I Love Lucy was the hit on television. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, crazy to think about, like when you if you ever go watch I Love Lucy, think about what Elvis was doing at this point in his life when he, this is he was just becoming who he became. Mm-hmm. At this point, when these shows are filmed, and see those shows seem more modern to me than than mid fifties. It, it they almost seem like sixties to me. You know why? You know why? Because Desi Arnaz, Desi Arnaz filmed those shows on film on movie film. Everybody else back then filmed, and the film was not of high quality, like the I Love Lucy show, because they were on movie motion picture film. And they shot the show with three cameras. So that's probably why you feel like it's different, because it looks different than everything else shot at that time. I mm-hmm. Love Lucy was like that first show that shot on film and that shot with three different cameras with edits. And I remember there was a story about those cameras where the the networks were fighting him, not wanting him to film like that because of something where they were filming in Los Angeles, but the film had to be in New York to be on the network television. There was something about that. Do you recall that story? Yeah, it's something like that where he's, you know, Desi Arnaz was a, a trailblazer in a lot of ways. And he and Lucy, they stood up to the studios. First off, they didn't want Desi to play her husband because they said that nobody would ever believe that this Cuban was married to you. And she was like, but he is married to me. And I'm not doing the show without it because their whole thing about doing I Love Lucy was her marriage was falling apart because they were never together because of their careers. So she wanted something where her and her husband was together all the time. And that's how I Love Lucy came came in, in reality. Hmm. Desi Arnaz taught them into letting us shoot this on film. We will edit here and we will deliver that show to you in time in New York City. That's and right. That's, they had to overnight it or something every time. They over. Yeah. But Desi Arnaz was brilliant. You know why? He made them, he made sure that he owned 100% of, their, of the, the film. So the reruns. He owned that film for every show. And that was a part of his contract that he and Lucy owned the rights to every episode on film. Which in the long run became very important money-wise. Yeah. And they ended up making a ton of money. You and I have been to Desilu, which is Red Studios. Yeah. And uh, also Amazon owns some of that now. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, they uh they they loaned the uh, sound stages that were behind the big the like, the house. The plantation house. Yeah, so it's kind of split up now. They own the old Desi Lou studio. Yeah. That, that's where you talk about where you and I stood out front. Yeah, with. but that's Desi Lou is not just that little block where Red Studios is. It's that whole area there. Yeah. Yeah. Remember they had yeah. the big water tower and they had the plantation house and Red Studios is not Desi. Uh, Desi 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 Lou was the other one we went to in in, in Culver City. Uh Red um uh, Lucy was filmed at Red studio though okay but that's where i'm thinking of is where the show was where people would wait in line to go in yeah and where andy griffiths was filmed 
Yeah, or Andy Griffith's film yeah, there too. Yeah. Seinfeld. Yeah. Yeah, that's Red Studios. Okay. Never but I thought that was still part of Desilu because it's close. I, I don't believe it was. I could be mistaken, but I, okay. uh, my memory, I'll have to go back and double check. I think it was Desilu before, way back. In that, I think it was part of it. But we did stand on that wall. I mean, we did stand beside the Isle of Lucy wall, didn't we? Yeah. That, but see, exactly. that's another iconic thing that he did as a live studio audience. That's another, yep. And mm -hmm. they shot that live. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they would work all week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday, I believe, was their film. It was like doing a play every week. It was. A new and play they, every week. And mm -hmm. they never did see the script uh, of the next show until after that one was finished. Interesting. It's a great so story. while you were down there, uh, Elvis bought an iconic car in Miami, the uh, 56 Continental Mark II. There's photos of him on a, it looks like he's on the top of a, a parking garage on the roof of it, which would be next to where the uh, Lincoln dealership and the Continental dealership was. Tell us about all that. I found it, Billy. You know, that was, uh, that, that picture has always spoke to me for some reason. I think I, uh, I love his uh, car. That's one of my favorite cars of his is that Continental. And uh, now. And I have a 57 model, same car. And I, hey. My guy has one. It looks just like what Elvis has. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. So and so, stay tuned. Stay tuned. No, no telling what the spy guy and Glow Trout and Trey will do with that. That's right. You haters. But anyway, <laughs> there's haters and there's haters. And, and, and there, while they're hating, we're creating. Let's just say that. I think I told one of them the other day. Why you? You uh, you're hating? I'm creating. Enjoy the film because you're watching. That's right. It. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, back to the story. I found a location, Billy. I found a location. And uh, um, uh, the reason that Elvis was there on that rooftop, it was uh, the dealership. It was mm -hmm. the, the uh, Mercury dealership, Lincoln Mercury dealership. And uh, he only was, he was staying. So he was playing the Olympia Theater, which was like two blocks behind the dealership. Okay. And he was staying one block over from the dealership. That entire area, Billy. Is gone now. I mean, I'm telling like there's nothing in those photos, those buildings, all those cool buildings that you see behind Elvis. Everything's gone. The entire area is different, man. So, but I was able because of the research that um, I did, and I a guy helped me that um, is a fan of the show, and he he's a really uh, um, uh, a good researcher. He was able to find some cool things to help help me see the layout even better. And I was able to give him some things that helped him find. And uh, I was able to stand on the exact location where Elvis would have been and point out where everything in those photos are. That's and cool stuff. And prove it with the roads there because the roads are still there, man. But that the the uh, rooftop that Elvis was on on the on the Lincoln Mercury, it jetted out over the road. And the road, I think, went up underneath that rooftop. Mm. Yeah. And that's because like it through the parking garage. Through the parking garage. And that's why you, we have the photos of Elvis. There's all kind of different angles. And you see water behind him one, one angle. That's because the water was down in that direction. You cannot see it now because of all the high rises and everything. Uh, uh, and then you have another angle and there's a, a hotel right on the other side of it. I was able to locate a cool photo of that hotel to uh, confirm that was definitely where we were at. So, uh, man, but that hotel has gone too, right? It's all gone. Yeah. It's all gone. The hotel Elvis stayed at is gone. The only thing there is the Olympia that's still there. And I think that's kind of not being taken care of too, too yeah. much. I mean, they're still using it, but I, a, a local was telling me all the craziness. Yeah. Everything. Well, the uh, so let's go back to the Continental, the Mark II, um, and I know we've talked about this before, and I've maybe even in these, uh, we've I've done so many things I can't remember what uh, what we've said and what we had said, but we've talked about this Mark II, right? On in one of these podcasts, no. Okay, so let's talk about the Mark II for just a moment then. So what that was is you'll hear a lot of people calling it a Lincoln Continental Mark II. In 56 and 57, it was a Continental Mark II. It was not a Lincoln. What Ford did was they were trying to compete with Rolls-Royce. 
So they created a competing line called Continental. Okay. And the idea was, is they were going to create a car that was going to compete with the Rolls Royces in amenities, in luxury, in price. So to give you an example, the car that Elvis drove there, which was the top of the line Lincoln at the time, which was a, um, a Lincoln uh, Premier was, a, was the type that it was. That was the one that the girls wrote their names all over. It was white, if I remember right. And uh, they had written on it lipstick. And he, uh, that car was $4,000, the Premier, which was the top of the line Lincoln at the time. The Mark II was about 11,300, depending on, they were, I think they were 10, nine to 12,000, depending on what kind of amenities you got. And one of the options, believe it or not, was air conditioning, which I can't imagine owning any car not having an air conditioner, but uh, only about 60% of the Mark IIs, they only made about 2,000 of them total, 56, 57. Only 60% of them had air conditioning. And uh, so other amenities, they all had leather interior. They all had all these chrome pieces. When you open the doors, the inside of the where the striker plates are, all that's chrome. There's chrome kick rails. Um, and they're very, very rare cars now. Um, and I think I mentioned before in one of the videos that Elvis is, if you go to Graceland, um, and I mentioned it in a video. I just don't remember which one. But if you go to Graceland and look at his car, where the back glass is, you've got the, the driver's glass, and then there's the small, what we would call rear quarter glass. Mm -hmm. Right by that rear quarter glass, there's a bump that goes up on the rear fender, and mm -hmm. you'll see holes there on both sides. And what that was was the intake for the air conditioning. So when you're driving, the air coming over the car would push in there because the air conditioner was in the trunk of the car. Okay. Uh, all those was under the back deck. You know, in, when you open the trunk, they have the back deck. The air conditioner's under there. And then they would port the air conditioner stuff back to the front. There's the Continental right there. What are you talking And about? they would port the air conditioner. Can you get a side view where you could see those holes in the I'm, I'm, in I'm thing? And um, later, they changed that because they figured out that it was not enough air support the air condition it didn't cool very well so elvis's has those mine does not my 57 model so what they did was over the years yeah i'm talking about it would be the quarter glass the rear glass so over the years between those two years basically when they started making the 57 they just went in one day and said okay from today forward they're 57 models there was no rear real change in them so yeah, that picture, it would be in the front of the glass. You can't see it there um, either. So it's one of those things. Let's see. Let me see if I can look it up. Is it one of these, like, Billy? Uh, well, it's behind that. So it's in between those two pictures. It's behind, it's the rear quarter glass. Okay. Well, yeah, it is one of my favorite cars of his. I just, and, and, and we know the story behind it now with Buddy. Conrad. Yeah. And that's what I was going to bring up. His buddy Conrad had a green one. And he went with, um, he took June and Pat. You figured that out recently, that he took June and Pat to to Miami to meet up with Elvis. And they was he was driving a mint green and, Continental Mark II. And Billy, I don't know if you know that, but, you know, that cool iconic footage of um, Elvis and Red and the guys shooting the guns off at the hack house. Mm -hmm. The mint Continental is in that film. You could see it in there, yeah. Or you can see in, in the driveway. And my car was originally mint green. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably going to go back mint green with it so in uh, kind of an ode to Buddy. Under Buddy, because I, yeah. You know, yeah. He, he's a Buddy Conrad, guys, is the only guy that we think showed up Elvis once upon a time. And that's why Elvis ended up getting this kind of little Mark II in Miami. Right, Billy? Yeah, I think Elvis really liked uh, Buddy because. Because he um, he didn't need anything from Elvis. Everybody else was always after money and and all of those things. And Buddy had money. He didn't need money. He had a he had a car that was almost three times as expensive as Elvis's car yeah, when he left to go to Miami. Let June drive that car out to Ocean Springs to see Elvis. And uh, June and Pat drives up the driveway there at the villas 
uh, Billy and I know exactly where those things were there at the Guff Hills at the resort. Sadly, they've been torn down. Sadly, been torn down. But uh, uh, Elvis got mad because she got out of the car and she, Elvis was like, whose car is this? And all he heard was my friend Buddy's. And he was like, well, who is Buddy? You know, who is this guy driving a Continental Mark II and let my girl drive the car? Mm -hmm. So uh, June said that Elvis got mad and went in the house and sulked. And he said a few cuss words here and there. And uh, and uh, and then Buddy came up on his motorcycle. See, Buddy drove like a Harley up to the post <laughs> streets and the thing. And then Elvis saw Buddy, met Buddy. And uh, yeah, everything was cool. He became good. So this right here, you can't see it in this picture, but that hump right there, there's holes in it on the front of it. Okay. So mine does not have that, but Elvis's does. And serial number wise, <laughs> mine was built, I, I believe, exactly 160 after Elvis's as far as serial numbers go. And serious, ser when I said serial number, Siri thought I was talking to, to her. So she jumped up and started started doing stuff. So tell me, go ahead. Uh, one thing I wanted to add, and I'm going to definitely expand in my episode whenever I put this out, is I learned something you might not know, Billy. That car that Elvis bought was shipped there for a doctor. Oh, I don't doubt that. Yeah, he was good for that. He did the same thing to Sinatra, didn't he? With the with the studs, yeah. Okay, he did. He, he took some yeah. ice cream. Yeah, so, studs, Frank Sinatra's studs, yeah. And the man, you, do, you, do you, you you remember there's a man in a photo talking to the colonel? Yeah. This is going to blow your mind. And I'm not going to tell anybody about it because I'll tell you after the show. All so right. Stay tuned to figure out who this guy was. This guy has a connection that nobody knows about. And that's probably why Colonel and Elvis was right there just chatting up with him because of this guy's history. And what could that be, Billy? You have no idea. No, nope, I'll have to. I'll have to dig into that. Look, look for my Continental Mark II Elvis Miami locations video in the near future. That's cool. All right, so let's Bye. not forget this. This is important. You didn't go to Miami to film Elvis stuff. You filmed Elvis stuff while you were in Miami. So tell us, tell us, tell us why were you in Miami? I booked a uh, sad commercial that's going to be played for a whole year next year. And uh, I have a really uh, cool character in the commercial that um, I can't really talk about it. And you were with a major star. I was with a major recording artist that you all probably have heard her songs. And um, she, um, you know, she's big time, big time, real pretty girl. And it was a, a, a major commercial, too. Yeah, yeah, it was a major company. Yeah, brand, a major brand commercial. And they made me look to parts. I can tell you that. Um, I mean, just think, you know, just, just think, <laughs> you know, character wise, you know, with the, the, uh, California thing going, you know, with the hair. Did the, you get to show your abs is what I wanted to know. I got to show. My <laughs> so you're in a commercial that's going to be on network television with your shirt off. Is that what you're telling me? I am Billy. I am. And, uh, you know, all the haters are going to run wild with that one. <laughs> <laughs> No. Well, the haters can get over it because they are not on a major network commercial with a major star. Oh, well, so, no. Yeah. Yeah. They'll be saying they are, but, you know, they, <laughs> glow trotting with Trey will show proof and can show proof and just go IMDB me. You know, I mean, whatever. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. back to the story is I, you know, I, uh, for two years now, I've been working my abs out because something had told me that I was going to book something that I'll have to be shirtless in and film is forever. So, you know, I want to, I want to at least look decent if I had to have my shirt off, you know, cause you know, there's a lot of girls out there that's going to be seeing this commercial, you know? And uh, so, man, when I booked this, I, I did the audition and uh, I, I did the art audition without my shirt on, of course, because of the character. And, um, and uh, I booked it. And yeah. they hired you. Yeah, and, uh, we, I had to do a fitting. And what a fitting is, is, you know, they have a wardrobe department where they fit the actors uh, in their wardrobe for the for the shoots. And man, they put me in like. Twelve or 14 different outfits, Billy. And um, uh, and I had to go in, in a room with the producers 
and you know they would look you up and down you know and they they pick one of the outfits for the commercial and um it's actually a a, a a suit that I'm wearing like a for you know I'm I'm trying not to give away what the character is yeah. but you know, it's something that you could see me playing you were typecast a little bit let's just say uh, that you know Matthew okay I, I'll give y'all a hint Matthew McConaughey played this guy in a commercial set in a tropical place so you know that can give you a hint for the people trying to figure out what I'm going to be portraying. and would the Beach Boys song play in in a scene like this I would think so yeah yeah all right so <laughs> anyhow that's just things for y'all to ponder and look forward to seeing for fun. love trotting with Trey um, I uh, I stayed on a in a condo on the um I stayed in a condo on the beach so every uh, morning I got up and I went swimming in the ocean and, uh, you know, talked to other people that were out there. It's just, it was really cool that the water was warm, warm down there in South Miami. I mean, you know, and a uh, uh, really nice place. And I, uh, I did, I did all the location videos that I could do. So a lot of really interesting things that I'll have coming up. Also did other history as, as y'all, y'all will know. And um, I, um, I had fun, Billy. You were so, there for a while, so you got to shoot a lot of stuff. I was there five days. Mm -hmm. I, I only got I only worked two days of the five, as far as with a with the uh, production. So that's pretty nice. So it's going to be fun, and the paycheck is going to be great. Yeah, listen, that's uh, that paycheck <laughs> is all on my face. I can tell you that. Yeah, I can't wait so, to, because you know it's you got to think it's a sad commercial. And it's, it's going to run the entire year. And they're going to pay me. Yeah, when he's saying SAG, he's saying that for you people that don't know, uh, most most professional actors have a SAG card. So that stands for something. Stage Actors Guild, right? Right. Yeah. So that is for professional actors. That's a, uh, that would be a, uh, uh, what's, what is it? A, uh, there's a word for it. Um, membership like a, it's a you know like for you get benefits and yeah but there's it's it's something else though it's a a thing like the the people that work for car places for manufacturers up in detroit um the union or, it's a union thank you that's what i was trying to come up with going through the big strike now yeah luckily it's, it didn't affect, it doesn't affect commercials so you're you know yeah. there's they're still shooting sag commercials because they have special things yeah that they, um uh, so yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm not a part of SAG. I, I, I am SAG eligible. I've been SAG eligible. And, and, but the thing is, Georgia is a right to work state. So they're, you know, they, so it's, it's kind of, it's one of those things. If you join SAG, you know, you're, you're kicking yourself out of doing all this other stuff too. Mm -hmm. But, um, so you I'm, have to be careful about, after this. And you work a lot in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. Around the area. Yeah. But yeah, that's why, you know, it just kind of fell in my lap. I did the audition and um, my agent contacted me, said, congratulations, you booked it. Uh, be in Miami, you know, let's fly to Miami on this date. So that's cool stuff. So you the did. We've got uh, we've only got about 12 minutes left. So let's talk about a couple of other things that you did. Recently, you went to a Baton Rouge in New Orleans. I did. Just so, got in and you, at 1 a.m. You got in last night, and um, so you went down there to film some stuff from one of your heroes. Tell us about that. I love Pistol Pete Maravich. Uh, he's one of my basketball heroes. You know, Michael Jordan and Pistol Pete are one, one and one. You know, there's not – I don't say that one's two or three. They're both one to me. Uh, but Pistol Pete uh, played at LSU, and a friend of mine pro just produced a short film about the pistol with a guy that – co-authored the first ever P Pistol Pete book when Pete was in college. There was a magazine called Maravich that was produced and they sold 10,000 copies for $1. He told the story the other day and mm -hmm. they used the best kind of paper, Billy, because the guy worked for the uh, newspaper there in, in Baton Rouge. And, um, and I was, a, I was lucky because the co the other guy, Steve Ellis passed away a few months ago. I met Steve last year in Baton Rouge when I went to Pete's statue induction. 
and he and I talked a lot. So I was luckily lucky lucky to have the time I had with learning Steve stories because he got he shared me a lot of interesting things. So now I met his other friend that did this magazine the other day. So the best part is I go to Baton Rouge and I go to the Cow Palace. The Cow Palace is where Pete played all the basketball games at LSU. Still there. All right. It's a no, it's a it's a cow palace. It's it's they have the cattle in the back, you know. So it wasn't really a basketball gym. They put a court in there during the season, you know, over the dirt. And that dirt's still in there. So anyway, I, I always have to stop at that place and just hang out for an hour or so when I'm in town. But after that, they uh they had the the movie downtown, the premiere. Two of Pete's teammates were there. I, I have two really great interviews with them. And uh, Pete's friend, Randy Drude, which is my friend, um, he uh, came to the premiere that night. And then the next day, Randy invited me over to his house and he showed me some things that Pete gave him over their friendship. And these are things that no one's ever seen before, man. I sent you a picture of one of the mm-hmm. things. Was that not That's a cool, cool yeah. picture? Um, um, so I, I'll have that in an episode pretty soon, but Randy had a scrapbook that Pete gave him and Randy gave me one of the pictures of Pete's. Wow. I'll own a really cool picture of Pete at LSU during practice at LSU in some kind of gym that I'm going to have to find now. It's, it's very distinct in this shot It's a wide shot picture in a poster board. Mm-hmm. And it's really a big, it's like a widescreen picture. And Pete is getting a rebound and his dad is up under the go. So Mm. Peter in the same thing. And also, Billy, I haven't told you this, but Press, which is Pete's dad, he did a newsletter to all of his family and friends back in the 70s. He would mail them like what's going on in his life. And uh, Randy gave me one of those. And on the letter, he always referred to Pete as Pistol Pete. So really. Yeah, he was he was saying what Pistol Pete had been doing on the basketball court in the NBA, and that's so how did he get that name? Uh, a, a reporter in in Clemson, South Carolina, when Pete was playing in, as a seventh grader for the varsity basketball team at Daniel High School, he uh, gave Pete a nickname as Pistol Pete because he said that when Pete went to shoot when he was a seventh grader, he wasn't strong enough to later on how he would shoot, so he had to draw the from his hip and it reminded this reporter of a cowboy drawing the gun from his holster. Wow. So he called him pistol Pete in one article and it stuck. Kind of like the Pete, Memphis mafia. Right. So mm-hmm. Pete became as a seventh grader, pistol Pete, which would become pistol Pete all the way through in the NBA. And we know him as pistol Pete. Now let me tell you this. I don't even think I told you this one, Billy. Randy found something in that scrapbook that he had never seen before. And it was an article. It was a, a it was a uh, note. OK. And on the on this note, the press had written to this guy. And the guy responded to the letter and said, of course, I remember you, coach. You're only one of the greatest basketball coaches in the country. I'm a big fan. And. Uh, please definitely bring your team out next time that I'm in Baton Rouge. I would love for you to bring your team out to my events and to meet you guys and stuff like that. And then he said, I've been praying for your son, Pete. So I hope and pray that at one day that he will accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and savior. And that's been, he's always in my prayers. And he said, Pete's one of his favorite basketball players and what a talent. Guess who that guy was? Hmm. Billy Graham. Wow. Billy signed that letter. Randy had never seen it before. And you know the story. About 25 or 30 years later, Pete gave his life to God and ended up on the Billy Graham crusade. Billy Graham, this was dated 1970 to Pete's dad, told press that he had been praying for his son Pete to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Wow. That was in a time when Pete was not a Christian. And Pete kind of uh, mocked Christians at that point. And that was a big thing, uh, you know, how uh, one night he was laying in his house, which I went to his house yesterday. And the lady allowed me to explore his home in New Orleans. And uh, uh, that is the house where one night and Randy told me that Pete was in the kitchen and was so excited to tell him what happened to him. And uh, 
Pete, Pete was having one of these nights where he couldn't sleep, Billy. And, and he was just laying in bed and he started thinking about all the bad times in his life and all the bad stuff that he had ever done in life. And he thought about the times where he ridiculed God and the times when he just about caused one of his best friends to not be saved because it embarrassed him personally uh, in this church where they were at. Uh, he went to a campus Crusaders for Christ basketball camp between his junior and senior year at LSU when he's like the top college basketball player in the country. So he's invited to come out to this camp to put on a basketball clinic, all right, to do all of his drills for campers. So Pete and his friend drove out there in Pete's famous Beetle that he had back then. He had one of those Volkswagen Beetles, a yellow Volkswagen Beetle. So Pete and his friend drive out to California and he said they drink beer and have a good time that entire trip. So they get out to this camp and Pete said, I never saw a basketball. And he said it was a bunch of people sitting around in these groups and they were all talking about Jesus. So he called them Jesus freaks. OK. So he said, I had no clue what I was doing here. You know what? I thought it was a basketball camp. So he said one night they had, some, I guess, a, um, you know, a sermon or whatever. And his friend gets up to go down to the altar to, to give his life to Christ. And Pete said, I grabbed my friend and asked him, what are you doing, man? You're embarrassing me. Sit down. Sit down, man. And his friend still went up there and gave his life to Jesus. So Pete said, so I got back in my beetle with my friend. He didn't drink no beer. It was a boring ride. I go back to LSU. I break the college scoring record. I do all of this stuff. All right. So he said, I was thinking about that that night, how I, I, I did tell my friend he was embarrassing. me. So Pete said that he thought of all the bad stuff he'd done. And he said, God, could you really forgive somebody like me? Could you forgive me? And Pete swears on it. And he swears to Randy. And Randy told me he, he, he swore to him that, that day in his kitchen at that house after it happened. He said, Randy, I heard a voice tell me, Pete, lift thine own heart. Be strong, lift thine own heart. And he said, it startled me. And I got out of bed and I looked around because I thought a man, somebody was in the house. He said he woke his wife up and he asked her and she didn't hear him. But she had been through all kind of crazy stuff with Pete over the years. Pete said he got down on his knees and accepted Jesus into his heart that night. And Randy told me yesterday that after that night and that conversation, he said that Pete was 100% a different person. And he said, I rarely saw him after that. Before then, he didn't really leave the house. He didn't do things. After that, I couldn't, I never saw him again because he was out talking about Jesus. He was out in the community delivering turkeys during Thanksgiving to the need, to the needy. He was out traveling, playing on a new basketball team called the Shooting Stars with Mother Lark Lemon, and they would play a game of basketball and then preach about Jesus. Wow. Pete became a born again Christian. I know. Man. Like, and in like three minutes, much. in 1970, we found a letter that Randy had never seen from Billy Graham telling press. And I pray for your son that he'll accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he did do that. But, man, it was just such a great weekend, man, because I was able to film a lot of Pete's places like I do with Elvis because I'm going to give Pistol Pete the Elvis treatment, as I mm -hmm. call him. And uh, I, uh, I, know, I know Pete's life like I know Elvis's life. That's how deep I know about Pete's life because before I even was a fan of Elvis, Pistol Pete, I was a fan of. And uh, his book is called Heir to the Dream. I highly recommend anyone that wants to be inspired and wants to learn about a fascinating professional athlete, Pete Maravich, Heir to the Dream. He wrote it months before his death, luckily. And I wrote, I read that book in like two and a half days when I was like 15 years old, man. And uh, everything that I pretty much accomplished in basketball, I scored a, over a thousand points in high school, Billy. I threw behind the back passes. They used to call me uh, Pistol Pete. You know, they used to call me White Chocolate because of Jason Williams. I was the only white guy on my team. Well, there was a, a, my, my friend Jeremy was also white. But, you know, I held my own with the, with the brothers out there, I guess, you know, to say. And they knew I could play. They knew I could mm -hmm. play ball, you know, and, and, and respected me that way. But uh, it was all because of Pete and my granddad and my dad.
uh, because I, uh, I studied his homework basketball series that he produced a year before his death. And uh, I just, I did those drills, man. I did those drills because I wanted to be like him. And uh, well, you really, come from a basketball dynasty anyway, your, your granddad and your dad. Our, our stories are similar because my dad was my coach. Pete's dad was his coach. Mm -hmm. So I do have that in common with, with Pistol Pete's. And uh, I'm just so glad that, you know, unfortunately, Pete died at age 40. And that's so what I, I was going to say. He died young. But tell us about his heart condition that caused that. All right. So y'all are about to be blown now. So and this is why and, and, and the author of the co-author of the Maravich magazine, I asked him a question the other night. I filmed it. And he said that he believes that Pete Pistol Pete was Pistol Pete for one reason. God put Pete here for the incredible story that he left behind and knowing what Pete would do at the end of his life for him. When Pete died, he died on the basketball court at age 40. He was in town in Pasadena Dina, to be on a radio podcast, like we're doing pretty much, I guess, back then, a broadcast with James Dotson. He's a big Christian, right, Billy? Yeah. James. Focus yeah. on the family, I think, is James Dotson. Dotson. That was the show. Yeah. Pete was okay. on that show, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, James had a bunch of friends that would play like a, a basketball pickup throughout the week. So he said, man, we could have Pete in town, man. Let's we're going to have our game instead in the afternoon, early that morning. So Pete could play with us. There's a VHS video of Pete playing in that pickup game that morning, hitting shots, doing his dribbling. It was awesome. So they after one of the games, Jack had just asked Pete or uh, James had asked Pete, hey, how Pete, how are you feeling today? And Pete said, man, I am feeling great. So he turns around and goes to get some water. And the next thing he knows, he hears a thud, thud. And he turns around and he sees Pete's face hitting the basketball court. He thought Pete was ribbing him because Pete was a practical joker, jokester. But Pete didn't move. Pete died right there on that basketball court, right after he had told him that he, had, he felt great. With James Dawson. With James and he wow. said, I just learned this. Uh, he, he said that James and all the other guys stood around Pete's body and they prayed. They prayed and uh, and they and he died. You know, Pete died at 40, 40 years old, 10 years or no, 15 years earlier when he was a rookie in the NBA. And then I'm going to get to the heart when he was a rookie, rookie in the NBA, Billy. There's a interview of him. And his young and cocky Pete. And he says, man, he says, I don't want to I don't want to play 10 years of pro basketball and drop dead of a heart attack at age 40. Pete played 10 years of pro basketball and he dropped dead on the basketball court of a heart attack at age 40. So when they did an autopsy on Pete's heart, he was born with a birth defect. OK. Never knew. He didn't have a main artery that we have that runs in one side of our heart. The right side artery of his heart somehow, and they don't understand how, somehow wrapped around the other side of his heart and pumped blood from that artery into his left side. And they said that first, that's a miracle. They don't understand that the artery somehow just wrapped around and, and attached inside the other. And they uh, people with that kind of birth defect doesn't make it past 20 years old. Now, when Pete was 20 year old, he was averaging 44 points a game in college basketball without a three point line, running up and down a basketball court, doing all this incredible stuff, stuff, you know, that no only a superman can do. Only a superhuman really can do what Pete Maravich did. His record's still not been broken today with three point baskets. All right. And that's what I was going to bring up. We'll leave it with that is that not even Michael Jordan broke his record. So tell the score, and that's what, on two-pointers. Yeah. And now they have three-pointers, and nobody's even gotten close. Pistol Pete scored 3,665 points in his career in college and averaged 44 points a game at LSU. So in the record-breaking game that nobody's broken, what's that? All right, so – Against Alabama in 1970, my dad and granddad was at the game. Pistol Pete scored 69 points against Alabama. Now, in the NBA, 
At 69 is his top in college. In the NBA in February 1977, Pete scored 68 against the New York Knicks. With Unbelievable. The chat. Now and that's with two points. That's with two points, man. And his friend Randy told me that he remembered Pete telling him, he said, Randy, that was the worst thing I could have ever done. And Randy was like, what do you mean, man? I'd love to score 68. He said, well, the next day I felt like I had to score 70. And I felt like if I didn't score 60 points and only scored 50, the fans are going to be disappointed because I could score 60. And you see it, it, it tortured Pete. And Randy said he had that problem. He had that problem where he never felt, and just like Elvis, that he was good enough. And mm -hmm. here he is doing all this unbelievable stuff, man. That's the saddest part. But Pete's story is also a story of redemption. And I wish I could do his movie because I know how I would end his movie. And I think Pete would appreciate how I would end his, end his feature film movie. Well, the Bible says that every man is appointed a time. We're all appointed a day that we're going to die. Well, let me bring there's this. Nothing up. we can do to change it. You'll like this one, Billy. Randy told me, he said, he remembered Pete telling him one day, he said, Randy, do you know what excites me, man? What just makes me so excited, excited, excited. And Randy was like, what? He said, I'm going to see Jesus Christ face to face one of these days. And he said, do you know this also, Randy? When I see Jesus, this is going to happen in a snap of the fingers that we're going to die in an instant, that it's going to be bam and we're gone. He, Pete, he met Randy said, he remembered Pete said, bam and we're gone. And he said, that is what excites me that I'm going to see Jesus. And, and, and Randy also told me, he said, after Pete heard God talk to him and after he told him that in the kitchen there at that house in New Orleans, he said, Pete stopped watching basketball. He stopped talking about basketball he stopped. <laughs> he drove in a very expensive car. And after he talked, he stopped talking. To, after he talked to God, after God came into his life, he sold that expensive car and bought like a. Like a minivan or something. Randy said he did it. He said he's amazing. And that's how God changed his life, Billy. And, that's and amazing. He definitely was a born again Christian. He was. And. Dead. We'll, we'll finish it with this is the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which is and, exactly what Pete was saying. And Pete, Pete talked about that and how, yeah. you know, that how it, he said, it's going to be happening in the snap. And it's going to be snap. with Jesus. Well, tighten up friends. Thank y'all so much for listening. We're running over and I couldn't do our three minute thing right in the middle of you talking about <laughs> Pete getting <laughs> saved, but that's all right. And uh, friends, y'all will just have to forgive us for going over. It was so important what Trey was talking and about. I want to say, if, if y'all are interested in what I was talking about, Pete, and how he became a born-again Christian, go do something for me right now. Go to YouTube and put Pete Maravich, Billy Graham Crusade. It's a 10-minute video. It's months before his death. It's two weeks after he got his ring for the Hall of Fame. His dad had just passed away. And Pete gives his testimony, man. And I'm telling you guys, it's incredible. It's incredible. Ten minutes. You got to go watch it. And if you don't know Jesus, get to know him. It will change your life. Because I'll guarantee it's going to happen in a snap, like Pete said, and bam, we're going to be right there face to face with him.